The following is brought to you by Digital Shelf Space, producers of GSP Rush Fit and Tour Academy Home Edition. Visit them online at digitalshelfspace.com. Welcome to Cambridge House Live. I'm Vanessa Collette at the Toronto Resource Investment Conference. I'm joined by Tom Drolet with Drolet and Associates Energy Services. Welcome, Tom. Great to have you here with us. Thank you, Vanessa, for having me. Tom, I'd like to start out just by talking about Japan. It appears that there's been perhaps more leaking than previously thought at the Fukushima site. Can we talk a little bit about that? Sure. On the water side, first of all, the major issue, of course, is the terrible disaster with the reactors themselves and the problem there is the fuel but we can get to that later. On the liquid side there's two problems, not one. One's being talked about but the other one is possibly more serious. Uh, with the water that was in the spent fuel bays and the cooling water from the reactors, they had to clean that up. So they have a clean up circuit and then they store the cleaned up water in these huge tanks. It's a, a tank farm that goes on hundreds of tanks, huge tanks. One of them started to leak. And frankly, the amount of radioactivity that leaked was not big. But with okay. a very sensitive Japanese public, things went viral and off it went with the media uh, and so forth. But the real problem is the movement of groundwater from the western hills through the site through the basement where a lot of the broken fuel is and into the ocean. That's the one with the ice wall that they need to stop. Okay. They need to stop the movement of groundwater through the site. So that's the main concern then? That's, that's my main concern and their main concern. Do you think the situation is overblown or is this something that you know is very serious? The leaking tanks, yes, I do believe that's overblown, but I don't think, I wish we could transfer the attention to the groundwater movement through the basement of the units and, and get that focused on because that must be stopped. The ice wall must be built and built quickly. Do you think they're going to be able to repair this anytime soon? They are, but what you know what it's doing, Vanessa? Overall, it's diverting the attention from the major uh, need, which is to clean up that spent fuel I talked about at the start. So it's, it's pushing everything back in time. We're now probably talking about a decade or a decade and a half before that site is totally cleaned up, dismantled, decommissioned, and put into what I would call a long-term care position. So are they going to have to shut everything down, all the facilities? All the facilities, they're going to... Well, they have two alternatives. And there's a debate going on right now. It's a very interesting debate. Which one will they choose? You could go like the Russians did with Chernobyl and build an esophagus or a, think of it as a concrete structure around it and just contain all the mess, okay, so or you could take the mess away. Okay. Personally, I hope they take the latter. Who says another tsunami isn't going to happen, another earthquake? And I think the responsible thing to do for all time by people is to get rid of it, store it in deep geological structures, and get rid of, of the whole site itself. Is there any contamination risk for the region? Well, there is the plume with the hydrogen explosions that happened on day two and day three. There were some uh, hydrogen explosions that drove up some of the cracked spent fuel into the high atmosphere, and it came over that exclusion zone uh, which is about 18 kilometers semicircle around the site. Uh, they've asked everybody to vacate that area. It's an exclusion zone. I personally think that the long-term problem there is not that critical. They can remove the top few centimeters of soil, the fauna and, and so forth, and have that habitable, but they'll probably turn it into a national park. Okay. Uh, that would be my guess. Uh, I'm not sure people will want to live there, even though it will be cleaned up. Well, we're at a resource conference, so how does what's going on in Japan affect the uranium sector still? 
big time. <laughs> yeah. There are, uh, the numbers are well known. There's about 435 reactors, power reactors in the world. By the way, we never talk about it, but about 200 plus research reactors that produce the radioisotopes for everything from blood work, uh, when you get your medical, to uh, breast scans and so forth. Anyway, those reactors take an awful lot of uranium, about 160 million pounds a year. Significant. A significant amount. And we have uh, the situation where 50 of the reactors out of the 52 in Japan have shut down. So there's excess inventory of uranium on the market right now. There's a lot of hype in the market saying there's going to be shortages soon. I will agree with that, but it's the definition of soon. Rather than next year, I'd go with three years from now, a lot of the inventories of uranium will be worked through and the industry had better get its act together to get production going again. I guess my real point is we've got time. So is this the reason why all of, all of these factors are not being shown right now in the price of uranium? Yeah, there's such a discontinuity between the short-term price, which is, by the way, only about 8 to 10 percent of all of the uranium that's bought or sold is on the spot market. Okay. 90 to 92 percent is in the long-term market. So where we need to pay attention is, what's the long-term market about and where's its price? It's currently at 55 to 57 dollars a pound and the buyers there are all the utilities, the Ontario power generations of this world, uh, the Exelons, the Florida Power and Lights, the Dukes, all of the major users of nuclear reactors on their systems and their fuel buyers, which have a subset of uranium buyers, they've got lots of inventory and they work on the long-term market and that price is 55 bucks. I, bottom line, my guess would be, I think the mar uranium price market within three years is going to be at the 50 to $60 range in the spot okay. and about 70 to $80 in the long-term market. What triggers would we need to see in order to see another $100 mark being surpassed? The world economy. Okay. It all comes down to demand for electricity because that's what uranium is used for predominantly. If the world economy, which seems to be recovering, but I'm not sure, other speakers can do better with that, uh, I'll, I'll go on the side that things are picking up slightly. Uh, if there was a trigger to the upside on the world economy, I think that would be a flash reason for uranium pricing to go up. But I see steady eddy times rather than flash hits upwards. Absolutely. Is China still planning on building as many reactors as they were announcing previously? Yes, right now they've got 15 reactors operating. Okay. And their plan says that they'll have 44 more by 2030. That's a big number. Which is what, uh, 17 years from now. <laughs> big number. Most of those are, in fact, all of them are either under construction or being detailed, designed and planned and equipment being ordered. So that's pretty sure. Their longer term plan by the middle of this century is that they're going to have a hundred plus reactors. So I think the world of uranium pricing will be driven predominantly by the Chinese, by the Indians, and by the Russians. We often forget to add in Russia. Russia today has 37 operating reactors and about another 15 on the drawing boards. So Russia itself, which is self-supplying, with uranium either within its borders or from Kazakhstan uh, will be a big drawer and a, and a driver up of the price of uranium with time. Just before we wrap up, can we touch on thorium? You've been talking about thorium as an alternative to uranium? I have. I'm a believer in the need for the nuclear industry, not a popular thing to say by the way, uh, that they need to change. There's two issues on my mind, the size of the reactors, the cost of the reactors is going up too far. Uh, I believe we should be 
looking at smaller module reactors that are passively safe. And ultimately, the real goal to my mind is to get to molten salt reactors where you can have thorium as a breeder blanket to create the uranium-233 to make them work, or you can even have spent fuel, dissolve that, put it in the molten salt, and do two things good. You don't need the thorium blanket, and you can get rid of the plutonium by burning it in the molten salt. So I see as a future less and less large reactors, more and more smaller reactors, and a gradual emergence into the thorium and uh, molten salt reactor business. Interesting. Well, we'll be watching with interest. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tom. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you, Vanessa, for having me.